Welcome back to the party, everyone. We're here at CES 2021. I'm Justine Zarek, and this is Rich Demiro. Hello to you, Justine. Hello, welcome to the party. <laughs> it is a party in here. It is, and it's only been a few hours. We have covered so much already. That's right, CES is the center of new tech and emerging trends. And just like we saw in that conference session, we can't ignore the advent of artificial intelligence. Through machine learning, AI enables so many things, process automation, object detection, and speech recognition, just to name a few. That's right, and it seems like whether you're catching this at home because all Oh, geez, sorry. <laughs> There's been so much going on already, it's overwhelming. But in the U.S. alone, shipments of smart speakers hit 42 million units in 2020. And that's a new record. Now, it's no wonder there is so much great programming that's geared towards this very topic right here at CES. You know, it's think about it. It's AI when I'm listening to you and processing what you're saying. That's true. Isn't yes. that interesting? We're all robots. <laughs> <laughs> Another exciting uh, area we're focusing on this year, you just said it. Yes, robotics. Robotics. Demand for autonomous robots have surged due to COVID-19. They have been used to deliver everything from groceries to medical supplies. And from the years 2020 to 2024, the market for them is expected to grow by $16.86 billion. That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I don't it's know. It's a lot of zeros. It's a lot of zeros. <laughs> Uh, if you find these topics as interesting as we do, there is so much content to choose from. All you have to do is search sessions and exhibitors by keyword. It's so easy. Uh, whatever catches your eye, just add, use that add to my show button to uh, make it show up in your planner and you can revisit anytime you want. Yeah, there's so much happening. So let's take a look at what's in the pipeline today. In just a few minutes, we'll drop in on the C space. This is the Entertainment Transformed keynote with media chairman and CEO Michael Casson, and he'll be talking to Ann Sarn with leaders from Nike and Spring Hill Company and General Motors. They're going to dive into how the pandemic has upended audiences' access to content and what's to come in a post COVID landscape. And that's at the bottom of the hour. Do you think the post-COVID landscape is all roses? Roses and vaccines, Rich. Oh, I like to see what you did there. We also have plenty of interviews coming along. We're going to find out how France has utilized technology to handle the COVID-19 crisis with French Minister Cedric O. Oh. And Rich, question for you. Would you get in a self-driving car? Would I? I? Well, I've been in a self-driving car, but do I want one? Absolutely, because I am so ready to watch all those streaming services. They just lounge back, <laughs> hang out, 405 traffic. Well, that's a very LA-centric thing. It is. It's a, it's a freeway with a lot of traffic. For sure. Well, at 12.15 p.m. Eastern and 9.15 a.m. Pacific, we're going to dive into another conference session about the future of autonomous and electric vehicles with experts from Virgin Loop, Aurora, and Caterpillar. And as always, if you miss a keynote address, conference, or spotlight session, it's NBD. No big deal. Yeah. I see what you mean. I knew say. you knew that. <laughs> you can access anything you want uh, that you missed or you want to revisit on demand right here on the site through February 15th. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel my Netflix right now because mm -hmm. I don't need it for the next couple of weeks. But I am glad, though, that you brought up the spotlight sessions because all of you at home, be sure to add a couple of those to your schedule, like one today with NXP, where they unveil the latest automotive and industrial tech breakthroughs. Now, uh, I kind of joked about Netflix because I can't, too many people are on my account. I can't cancel it. Yeah, whole well, family. <laughs> Did I just say that? Uh-oh. Uh, if you're like me, streaming has become the go-to when it comes to finding new shows to binge or rediscovering old favorites. Streaming platforms have increased uh, subscribers 400% since March 2020. Here's a clip from the conference session, Streaming's New Era with leaders from Amazon, Warner Media, and Stars discussing where these platforms may be going next. It takes me back to, I don't know if you've ever seen Back to the Future 2, where you have a portal into the world and it's a screen. And I, I think that's the direction we will go. Um, another thing that we announced this year for the Alexa generally is conversational TV, where you can have a conversation with Alexa and you take it a step further with your TV and say, hey, what do I want to watch today? What was I watching? What do you think I should watch? And start to have sort of more interactive things. So I think we're the first step of voice, but you can really see where this goes next as we get richer and more personalized experience where you sort of have a relationship with the TV, with, it, with, the, with sort of your portal into the world, and it helps you kind of shape your life in new and different ways. 
Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, the only things I want from Back to the Future 2 are the hoverboard I was promised, <laughs> if Sporks mm. Almanac, so I can make some. Uh, Stephanie, um, you know, it, it's something that Sandeep mentioned, which I thought was interesting, was, you know, hey, tell me what I was watching. It seems yeah. like a natural next step is tell me what my friends are watching. You know, do you see the the social graph and the interest graph coming into play here? And is Stars thinking about that from a product standpoint, where the recommendation engine goes well beyond what the software knows about the particular viewer's interest, but also people within their network who may have similar tastes. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, you know, it's sort of trying to get your handle around those um, those trends and those sort of micro trends of, of viewership amongst people and build those really dedicated audiences. Um, absolutely. And, and we work with our partners like Fire TV and Google and others as they continue to kind of build these interactive experiences with viewing. Um, Stars also has built profiles. So we're, we're moving in that direction, too. I think that we're um, just trying to make sure that we can we can make it as easy as possible for our consumers on whatever platform they consume content to engage in those kind of conversations, those kind of experiences. All right, so Justine, are you ready to have a full-on conversation with your TV? Do you mean people aren't doing that already? Because oh. I definitely am talking to my TV. <laughs> uh, what are you saying? Are you, so w tell me what you're doing with that. So I think what they're talking about and what you're also saying is having more kind of conversations, but that's already sort of there. And I think the future of AI is to make those technologies better. So if I'm telling my TV, I want to watch a movie from Brad, Brad Pitt, it'll know that, okay, you've already seen this one, this one, this one, you might like this. Uh, we're sorry, Justine, but you've already seen all of them. <laughs> They're like, sorry, you did. You've seen every single one. But I, I agree. I mean, that's the thing. Like, if it gets to know you and it builds this, like right now, this is kind of what Netflix is doing, these other streaming. They kind of get to know you and that front page is populated with stuff you like. But imagine that with a voice assistant. It's like, you know, hey, uh, you know, whatever. There's so many of them. Uh, show me something that I'll, I'd like to watch since I watched this movie yesterday. There will be times where Siri will say, who's speaking? Just to make sure that it is me and, or if it's my sister. So they're always, are, they're always asking just to make sure. Voice authentication. I love that. My kids don't like that, by the way. <laughs> they try to do my commands. All right. Uh, time to check in with you at home. So uh, we are getting a lot of tweets from uh, you on the uh, big board here. So should we check some? Yeah, check it out. OK, let's go uh, straight up here. I see, I'm looking in the right-hand corner here. I see my pal Lance Yulinoff. You know him. I do. Hey, Lance. Thanks for the tweets. This is me at CES 2021. The only thing missing is my lanyard and badge. And I love that picture. He's got one, two, three, four, five, six screens going on. Some are not lit. Yeah, I'm wondering how many times he took this to get the right shot. It took a while. I don't, for you sure. know what? I don't see an Apple Watch on him, though. That's surprising. Oh. A little knock for that. All right, this is kind of cool. Look at this. Impressive seeing the tech evolution. Do you remember this? 1970 versus 1920, 10 megabytes versus a terabyte. Uh, that is just wild. So I don't remember that. It was 1970. I, I unfortunately wasn't here yet. But the fascinating thing is storage because in the future, a lot of this is going to become non-existent because we're going to be storing everything in the cloud, as we saw earlier from the Microsoft uh, keynote. You know, things are just slowly going in that direction, especially yeah. with 5G. Um, but by the way, that little tiny one terabyte, there's even smaller. That's not a micro. No, it's not, but that still is pretty impressive. All right, now here's a throwback to actual um, in-person CES. Uh, Glenn says, another day at CES 2021 just wouldn't be right without the Nikon USA bag. And I know we have people that are, um, you know, haven't been to CES. A lot of these booths have bags that can help you, you know, collect the sh all the swag. Yeah. <laughs> but the Nikon one was kind of iconic because they yes. would give out so many of these that you would see them all over the place. And it was always super helpful because you always had things to collect and you needed something to put it in. Isn't that the smart thing, though? It's all marketing. Okay, one True. more. Evan says, are you this old? And he's got <gasps> Winamp. I am, unfortunately, that old. But I also was a Mac user, so we didn't even have Winamp for quite a while. I love that Winamp was just such a lightweight application. It was. Well, guys, make sure you guys keep that conversation flowing by using that hashtag CES21, CES, uh, did I say that right? Oh my gosh, I, almost, I yeah. thought I was worried. I thought I said CES2020. But no, we're here 
digital CES 2021. Use the hashtag so we can find your tweets. And see, you know we're live. I know. See, you know we are here in person. We are not robots. We're real humans. The COVID-19 pandemic upended the entertainment industry. Studios had to pivot away from releasing films in theaters to connecting directly with audiences at home. Coming up in a moment, in the C-Space Entertainment Transformed keynote, we'll hear from Chairman and CEO Michael Kasson of MediaLink and Warner Media Studios and Networks Chair and CEO Ann Sarnoff. It'll be followed by a chat with leaders from Nike, the Spring Hill Company, and General Motors. We will see you in just a bit. Thanks again for joining us for this totally reimagined CES 2021. For the first time in this show's 54 year history, we're all digital. And we're not the only ones that are changing how we communicate, engage, and inform. Our phones, tablets, and TVs are portals to the best in entertainment. And we're leaning into online gaming like never before. We're connecting by video chat for celebrations and holiday gatherings. And we're working out alongside thousands across the country. Our living rooms are the new sports arena as we cheer for our favorite teams from home. And thanks to a revolution in streaming technology and a commitment to finding ways to be social in a time of social distance, marketers and agencies and content creators have had to pivot to this new reality fast. And at the same time, they've had to be willing to look ahead at what consumers will want as we move past this pandemic. Joining us in just a moment is Anne Sarnoff, Chair and CEO of Warder Media Studios and Network Groups. Anne is responsible for Warner Media's content-focused teams, including Warner Brothers, Pictures Group, HBO, and HBO Max. She brings more than 30 years of business and media experience to this post as she leads Warner Media in its mission to engage and delight global audiences. Anne will be interviewed by MediaLink Chairman and CEO Michael E. Casson, power broker and trusted advisor to Fortune 100 CMOs, media moguls, and tech pioneers alike and a longtime partner of CTA and the host of the C-Space keynote. This is Anne's first major keynote address since assuming this role of chair and CEO in August 2020. And later, Michael will be joined by a group of innovative CMOs and entertainment executives who are reimagining the future of entertainment. Please join me in welcoming Anne Sarnoff, chair and CEO of Warner Media Studios and Networks Group, and Michael Casson, chairman and CEO of MediaLink, to CES. I'm Michael Casson, Chairman and CEO of MediaLink, and I'm delighted to spend the next hour speaking with some of today's smartest and most influential executives about the current and future state of entertainment. 2020 had a massive impact on the way people live, work, and play, but very few industries have been impacted as profoundly as entertainment. New platforms and shifting consumer behaviors have dramatically altered the entertainment landscape, requiring innovation and fresh thinking from every player in the ecosystem. I'm thrilled this morning to welcome Ann Sarnoff, the chair and CEO of Warner Media Studios and Networks, to join me in exploring how this brave new world for entertainment will impact us. Following our conversation, I'll sit down with executives from General Motors, Nike, and the Spring Hill Company to unpack what this means for content creators and marketers alike. But first, please welcome Ann Sarnoff to your screen. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Michael. It's great to be here. Thank you. And let, let me start with your industry background. Uh, when you were named uh, to the current role at Warner Brothers, um, people said, gee, Anne's from uh, outside the entertainment industry. Well, that's not true, obviously. You've spent most of your career in, in all things entertainment. Uh, you were outside of the, quote, film industry, I guess. But um, especially in times like this, when playbooks have had to be rewritten, um, maybe that fresh perspective was exactly what the entertainment industry needed but you know again you began your career at viacom you've you've worked across nickelodeon and noggin uh you spent time at the wall street journal and dow jones running live events and conferences and you know most recently uh the the uh, the bbc role that you had but i can't leave out the fact that the other area that's been so impacted 
you know, by the current situation. Sports, your, your stint as the chief operating officer of the WNBA, uh, you could have been part of the bubble. Um, uh, there you go. But uh, what I'd love to hear from you, Anne, is how that prepared you for this role and for, as I said, kind of being very much uh, with pencil in hand, rewriting the script. Oh, thanks, Michael. Well, um, yeah, it, it does sound like a lot of different um, industries and jobs when you put it all together like that. And, and I do think it's the collection of all of them that helped prepare me for this position, first at Warner Brothers and now at Warner Media Studios and Networks. And, you know, one of the things that <clears throat> all of those positions had in common is working with incredible um, franchises and IP and content. And um, I'm a huge fan of, uh, you know, amazing brands and brands that can be built into franchises. So um, back, as you said, starting at Nickelodeon, um, I was able to build out the, the businesses around the core television network and working very closely with them and with the movie division and built out a franchise business and kind of a 360 branding business, if you will. And that has served me very well to this day in terms of having that experience base under my belt and being able to, to know how to work closely with creators, how to recognize IP that can be built and extended into different businesses and, um, and super serving our fans as we did back in the day at Nickelodeon with uh, kids at the center of everything we did. So that's very much what I'm bringing to the, um, to the position today in terms of our incredible IP with D the DC universe, Harry Potter and Wizarding World, Game of Thrones, and, and a lot of the amazing content on, on HBO, and now a lot of that coming on to HBO Max and um, super serving fans in a different way and kind of a future facing streaming service. So yeah. um, that's, that's a bit of a summary of how I got here, but uh, we can go into more detail if you'd like. Well, I, I think that's a great uh, drum roll to, to say exactly that, which is how you got here. And, you know, I would characterize you as the Wonder Woman of 2021. Uh, but I will tell you that I did spend Christmas Day watching uh, Wonder Woman 1984. And uh, uh, my guess is, you know, millions of others uh, joined me in that in that quest talking about franchises and, and the importance of franchises. Um, I think the treatment of Wonder Woman in the unusual circumstance that we found ourselves in in 2020 um, and continue to find ourselves in in 2021, um, really you rose to the occasion. And I think, uh, you know, did that which was the right thing to do, but that which was what the consumer and the fans really wanted was that thirst for content. Could you talk a bit about fandom and how that and, and how that played out? and? the kind of results that you got? We started thinking about what we could do for our DC fans this year, this past year. And um, the marketing teams and our DC franchise team uh, came up with this idea of having a 24 hour kind of a super event for fans uh, and very much connected to our talent and creators as well. I think we had over 500 talent appear uh, throughout DC fandom. So it was really about engaging them in a way that respected everything that they love about DC and brought it to life in a new and different way and didn't let the pandemic get in the way of that. You know, we were able to connect virtually and celebrate um, the amazing movies we have had and those coming up, like the Batman, as you probably saw, um, clips from the Suicide Squad, Wonder Woman 84, uh, et cetera, as, as well as our great shows on the CW and, and um, uh, consumer products. Uh, we, we had Venus Williams designed a whole line around Wonder Woman 84. So products were selling off the, off the shelves, off the virtual shelves during fandom. We talked about new um, interactive games that would be coming out. So it really was a tribute to the things that the fans love about DC and bringing it all together in, in one place and one point in time and in creating event, an event of it, which we're very, very proud of. We had over 22 million fan interactions at DC Fandom in August. Crazy. Well, w w my house was, was, was full of a lot of fan interactions uh, in, in most of that 24 hour period. And let's talk about um, uh, content. Uh, obviously at the center of what you do. Um, Warner Media, Warner Brothers, you know, the various uh, 
divisions within the, the Warner Media Company, historically, like many large entertainment companies, tended to be siloed and tended to be HBO over here and Turner over here and Warner Brothers over here. And, you know, within that context, one of the things your pur purview has done is kind of brought it all together. Um, it, how is that working out in terms of bringing all of that collective energy together uh, to, to tap into that creativity uh, and, and have that unique Warner Media you know, point of view? Thank you for that question, because it is something I'm, I'm most excited about and most proud of in terms of the progress we've made in the last year. And uh, when I was talking to John Stanky, who hired me a year plus ago, year and a half ago, um, about the position, he talked about breaking silos. And I, I knew that the, the old time Warner was a siloed company. It was um, much written about. And what I didn't realize is how siloed Warner Brothers, as you mentioned, was in and of itself. Um, so I think uh, my background and, you know, that you pointed to earlier, kind of creating and building franchises and and um, and really building bridges. My, my job at the BBC, I was the only executive uh, at BBC Studios who wasn't sitting around the table in London. So I had to be a collaborator and um, somebody who knew how to work across the aisle, if you were, and in this case, across the ocean, oceans. Um, so I think John saw that in my background, and I am um, proud of the work we've done in the last year, DC Fandom being a good example, because we had movies, we had games, products, television, streaming, everything was represented there. So since I joined in August of 2019, we have had weekly meetings um, on our big franchises, uh, talking about how we can collaborate together, how we make the whole more than the parts, how we bring the um, the 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 amazing characters and stories to life in a new and different way. And one of the things I said to them early on was, look, you don't want your fans to see your org chart. And boy, can they see it right now. Like <laughs> they can see that the movie has nothing to do with the TV series, et cetera. And so, so well now, said. yeah, everything's connected now. And, and we're building a, a DC universe plan that uh, is a much more centrally connected but individually executed, um, I think it's it's really upstream in the planning that it all needs to come together so people can still feel a pride of their individual efforts. Um, so I'm really I'm really excited about the the plans ahead. And we're living in a world where everyone has to be focused on so many different things. One thing that is at the forefront for everybody that we deal with in our respective businesses, sort of at that intersection, you've heard me describe MediaLink historically as living at the intersection of marketing, media, advertising, entertainment, and technology. Well, so are you. You are living at that intersection, but we're also living at an intersection where diversity and inclusion are, are, are so high on everybody's list. You broke a pretty thick glass ceiling to be the first uh, woman to be running the Warner Brothers studio, one of the vaunted you know, studios in history. Um, and, and again, that was important. And you know, back to what we started with, your skill set was very diverse coming into the role you're in. You, again, you hadn't grown up in the film business, you, you grew up in the business of entertainment and marketing and content, but not film. So that diversity works as well there. If you could riff a little, as I just did on that question, riff a little on, on how important that is to all of us, but to you particularly, being a trailblazer. Look, it, it's, um, it's a huge issue for me. I've, I've tried to, as you said, blaze trails my whole career. I don't, I don't know if I had a particular goal in mind, but I, I certainly in every job I had tried to do my best and to break whatever glass ceilings I could. Um, I mean, I actually started in strategy consulting back in the day. I had to pay down a lot of <laughs> educational loans, so I had to make a lot of money early on. And then after I did, I got into media. But in that firm, it was all male partners. And um, but in, in terms of being a woman in this industry, um, you know, it hasn't been easy. And earlier on, you you had in, in, in most industries, you had to conform to more of the, the male culture. And, um, you know, as I, I would say about diversity and inclusion, like oftentimes you feel like you got to check some of your bags at the door when you walk in. You can't bring your full self to work. You have to hide parts of yourself, the, you know, whatever, quote unquote, more female characteristics. And at Nickelodeon, honestly, it's the first time where I felt I could bring my full self in. And part of it was because it was being run by Jerry Laybourne, who was a woman. And 
the staff was 60% female. And so I went from, you know, I did a 180 from a male dominated and led um, consulting firm to uh, to a much more forward kind of um, facing uh, organization. And so I saw that as an example of, you know, get a seat at the table and then make a difference. Jerry was running that company and she made a difference and she made sure that over 50% of the staff w was women. And, and as you said, there was a diversity of thought. You know, we weren't kids. And so we couldn't just think like, you know, in our own bubbles. We had to be very research, very consumer focused and kid focused and, um, and have the teams be diverse so we could be the most creative version of ourselves. And, and oftentimes I think what you find in very homogenous corporate cultures is that people are kind of finishing each other's sentences and that to me is the worst thing possible. Like if you have a team that's only finishing your sentence and not shaking it up and not being provocative, you're not gonna grow. You're, you're gonna be beaten by the competition. So um, my, my general journey was to get a seat at the table and then to make a difference. And that's what I'm trying to do here today. And I think if you look at some of the changes on our exec team recently, um, you'll see some uh, much more diversity than there was previously and um, more to come on that front. I, I want to go back to another part of your career and talk about changes. So your, your stint at the uh, COO of the WNBA, um, there were not, as I said at the opening, two industries that were more upset uh, than sports and pure entertainment in, in the movie business. Um, in the one case, we saw basketball played in a bubble, and the panel that's going to join me uh, after this co conversation with Maverick Carter and Adrian Lofton, along with Deb Wall, but you know, from a Nike perspective and, and Maverick from a pure sports and basketball perspective, we saw what the bubble did and how it worked. And you've had your own kind of bubble with uh, distribution of films. I mean, you know, we've all been sitting around in 2020 waiting for that next shoe to drop as to when will I be able to go back to the movies. And, you know, I guess that that bears the most important question, which is what's your view on that? Um, you know, you, there there is a clear statement right now that you're going to make the content available for this period of time. Uh, where the fans can enjoy it uh, in a broader base on HBO Max. Uh, but, you know, I know you've said and I've heard your leadership say you're not calling this the death of the of the theater industry. Can we talk about that a bit? Well, first, we we were able to release some movies um, in the pandemic, which you saw our release of Tenant at the end of August, early September. Uh, which we're very, very happy to do and happy with the results. Um, we have grossed over 360 million globally, but I have to say that is a pretty good result um, for for what we did with Tenant. And, and we said it was going to be a marathon, not a sprint. It is really hard to launch, uh, to spend the marketing you need to spend and launch when certain cities are opening, certain cities are closing. Uh, and you know, you're booking your marketing, as you know, Michael, eight weeks in advance. So you're kind of shooting a moving target of, of how much of the market is going to be open or not. So we just decided to be in it for the long game and open the movie. There were more um, international markets open in the summer, towards the end of the summer, and we knew that tenant would play well overseas. So we, um, we took a bet, and um, I think the bet really paid off for us. And then in terms of our strategy with the day and date on HBO Max, as you said, we're, we're pivoting to, to be able to adjust to the environment we live in. Do I wish the pandemic were over? Of course I do. But I have some amazing movies that I would like the fans to be able to see. And because so much of the market, especially in the US and now Europe, is closed down with I think 60 plus percent of theaters are, are closed right now. So uh, again, you can't do it just by by launching in theaters. We needed an alternative, um, a platform, if you will, and decided to um, to to have fans be able to watch Wonder Woman eighty four and now our entire twenty twenty one slate on HBO Max for thirty one days while they're while these movies are playing in theater. But but um, remember, this is a global theatrical release, and HBO Max is is U.S. only that thirty one days. So right. we're we're making the best um, we, what we think is the best decision. Let me let me ask uh, another question. Yeah. Let, let me ask another question. You know, I grew up in this town um, called L.A. Um, you know the mantra in Los Angeles: instant gratification isn't quick enough. 
Um, you know, how do I get it faster? One of the things that we've all lived our life and you're going to kind of live and die by that opening weekend box office. And, and you know, that metric um, doesn't seem to make sense in the current moment uh, as a gauge of the success or, or, or lack of success. And, you know, Netflix as an example is notoriously tight lipped about viewership and, you know, what have you. Do you see any move in the industry cross in cross industry in terms of transparency on numbers? And is, is there a need? I guess, you know, are the amount of eyeballs necessary unless you're trying to sell advertising against it? Uh, are, are, the, are the amount of eyeballs necessary other than the economics of them to, to you know, determine the success or failure? Uh, do you think there's a need for it or is that ship already sailed on what the quote opening weekend, uh, you know, my air quotes, uh, aside opening weekend box office was? I think it, it's a good question, Michael. And I think what opening weekend is and was, was a proxy for the success of a movie because there were, um, you know, formulas you could apply to then project your ultimates of what the movie was likely to do. And um, sometimes those formulas worked and sometimes they didn't. But on average, I think most people felt it was a good proxy for the success of something. You have other examples like Joker, which opened to, you know, 60 million and went on to do over a billion, right? So nobody called that one early. So again, it's it's a shorthand way of, of ascertaining whether something's successful or not. In the streaming world and having launched the service BritBox, I, I've had a few years experience with this. Um, it is a completely different set of, of criteria. Um, as you said, unless you're serving ads, the eyeballs in that kind of day and day world are less relevant to the overall engagement of the service, the, the amount it costs you to acquire a subscriber, the, um, the, the churn level every month, how many people leave the service, what you can do to reduce the churn, reduce your cost of acquisition. It's a completely different set of metrics that um, the, the industry is not geared to measure. So the, the long-winded answer to your question is yes, I do think that will change over time when more of the world is looking at streaming and looking for proxies of success, my guess is there will be things that we will learn sooner on in the equation and including Netflix, people will just, because the talent will want it, the talent will want to know how they're doing. Everybody wants yeah. a barometer, right? Everybody wants to know, how am I doing coach, right? And um, uh, so I, I do think things will, um, will kind of shift over time. And, and, you know, I, I can't avoid asking you the question from, the, you know, my day job, which is looking more at that intersection that I alluded to earlier, but looking at the marketing side, uh, you know, more directly. One of the things that we've experienced in working together with, with many folks on your team, um, this need for a more performance driven um, it, subscriber acquisition marketing mentality versus uh, the, the more um, one-off transactional uh, view of can I put those butts and seats on Friday when I open the movie. Uh, now we have to look at, as I say, the subscriber acquisition and the lack of churn and, and the like. What are you seeing in terms of that uh, from how we market and how you market? Well, I think it's all a work in progress. I think, um, you know, uh, especially given this hybrid strategy, we're working very closely with Andy Forsell because, you know, I'm on the content side of things. He's on the product and, and we, we kind of um, share the marketing uh, um, of the entire service from a content and from a uh, service perspective. So uh, we have to work closely together to understand which audiences we're targeting, which kind of um, subscribers we're targeting, and how do we, what messages are we sending out there, right? Because he's got a, an agenda of the entire service, and on the, on the 2021 slate, we have certain things we're trying to convey in terms of this is a special circumstance given COVID, so there's marketing question, messaging that needs to go out that's, that's kind of a kind unique, of utilizing um, one of the most a unique uh, words of message to, to and our, that our fans pivot. that they're not used to. Maverick, so some of it has um, to break through the clutter and saying, like, oh, yeah. you mean I get to watch that on HBO Max? 
or in you theaters. And obviously, God knows many theaters are closed. So, so for certain fans, it's only I get to watch it on HBO lives. Max, and for others, they'll have a choice. So that's a lot of heavy lifting that the marketing kind of messaging has to do. And um, yes, really, for sure, you know, it's, kind of it's um, down definitely on evolving and, and to more performance based, and that's a that's going to be shifting as well because the more streamers come on, like Discovery Plus launched yesterday. The more the competition shifts to a different type of uh, of um, competitive set, and 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 more people start going after the audiences that you're going after, and then of course that raises the bar, and that makes you think more creatively as to how you can uh, go find your your fans. Yeah. On that note, I want to say thank you, and I want to tell you I'm a happy subscriber, uh, multiple accounts uh, for HBO Max, and I look forward to a a, a lot of good content. I know that library is is full up, uh, and I know the slate is, is going to make this a great year uh, for Warner Media and for you, Ann Sarnoff. So thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to welcome Deb Wall, CMO of General Motors, Maverick Carter, founder and CEO of the Spring Hill Company, and Adrian Lofton, the Vice President for North American Marketing for Nike. What I'd love to do is dig in with all of you to what this means for your brands, your fans, and your communities. I'd love to start with a general question and one that's kind of utilizing one of the most overused words of 2020, and that word is pivot. Maverick, um, I'm going to start with you. Um, you've had to make pivots this year, God knows, uh, across so many aspects of, of our business and our personal lives. Is there one particular pivot or one particular kind of change of perspective that you've had to really, you know, kind of double down on? And, and is that something that you could uh, light up for us? The, the main thing that we had to figure out is how do, if you can't touch and be around people and seeing people and hearing from them, then how do you truly continue to be creative and then continue to empower people. And I think obviously with everything that happened for, for black and brown people in the, in the U.S., uh, going back to George Floyd and up till now, that idea is now seems like finally hitting home with many individuals and big companies. But for us, the big pivot for us was figuring out how do we actually continue to be creative through Zoom meetings and, and, and Microsoft team meetings and all of these meetings through a screen, which has not been easy. But what we discovered is, is that you still can bring people together, you still can be social, and you still need to have some layer of connectivity. And what we learned is literally we would start starting meetings with instead of just jumping right into the meeting, which you would do in an office, like I can see Deb's background and I see, you know, where she's at and I see Adrian, I see yours, Michael, literally making each other talk about where we're at, what we're going through that day, because we were trying to make sure we have some level of connectivity because staring at each other on screens every day, you lose all sense of connectivity and connective tissue. And the only way to bring that back is to talk about what's, what you're dealing with personally. And we would make each other talk about one or two things, literally in our background. Sometimes it'd be people's kids. Sometimes it would be the car. Sometimes it'd be their wife or their husband or whatever. And we, we found that to be very, very helpful. And people actually got to know each other better. It's, it's, it's so true. I, I, I have a couple of case studies of relationships that, you know, started during the pandemic and have blossomed into true friendships. And as you say, without that physical contact. Deb, from, from, from your perspective as a marketer, when was the pivot, going back to that word, from um, purpose-driven, particular to the pandemic, back to traditional marketing, which is buy this on sale now, you know, come in and get it. Um, and, and A, did that get back to where it was, and B, have we have we moved beyond the the need to say we care we're here obviously we still care and we're still here but do we need to be saying that in every in every commercial message and every marketing message well i i think the whole point of that michael was that it brought everyone to a whole different focus on what are we messaging and who are we talking to and much more like maverick was talking about our concern with each other and how we're working together, I think that whole concern expanded. So it brought everyone to the fact of, let's get much closer to our consumer 
And then the other key point that has come in, which I think is going to continue with us, it got everyone laser focused on our purpose and what we were doing. And, you know, we're right in the middle of launching a campaign called Everybody In uh, about our collective future and um, where we go and how we all work together to make something big happen for the world. But turning to an all electric future is really important for all of us as we all deal together. So I think what's been really interesting is that first push where we did the Chevy Cares and each brand really focused on its customers. That led us to a real uh, laser focus on purpose, which for us as we started doing building ventilators, the whole company sort of changed its mode and its focus of operation. And you're going to see that going forward. Adrian, um, Nike has always had, in my recollection, a purpose-driven message. And social purpose really rose to the top of that, um, it, it, you know, this year uh, for sure. How do you continue to manage uh, that, which is core, I think, in most consumers' minds to what Nike stands for, uh, you know, beyond just do it, uh, which it still means that to me, uh, but but in a year where purpose and social justice and things have become so relevant and so hyper focused, it, 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 there's a balance you need to have, right? That's not your primary business, but it is core to your business. Uh, and, and I know that's kind of a compound question, but uh, have your way with it. Uh, you know, I, I'll allow you to riff on your answer just as much as I riffed on my question. Did you riff? I mean, there's a couple things that I'd say, and and Mav and Deb said it quite beautifully. The first thing is, um, when we thought about, you know, as we moved into from spring to summer, a couple things became true, right? So COVID hit, um, we were confined to our homes, not just in working to the point Mav made on how do we move 100% to digital and how we're working, but also how we're connecting to our consumers. And so Nike is a brand that believes in the experience. We always talk about experience and relationships over transactions. So it's never about selling the shirt or the shoe. It's about the experience we bring to the consumer. Um, and so that was enough, right? Thinking about how to go from experiential to digital overnight. And then if you compound racial injustice um, and the deaths that we experienced inside of our company and outside of our company with our families, it was compound on compound on compound. And so the first thing I'd say, and I want to just kind of echo what we heard, making sure that we celebrated our team through the lens of kind of imperfection and progress over, um, you know, sort of progress over the perfection idea is really important. And so you actually can't get to being purpose driven unless you're comfortable being uncomfortable and potentially making mistakes. And, and Nike has never been afraid of leaning in and potentially making a mistake if it's what we believe in. And so when you go back to our core values, one of the values of the company has always been do the right thing. And it is something that we say in meetings in frank sentences uh, when we don't even know it. And so when we found ourselves in the middle of racial injustice and this idea that we needed to redefine the conversation, the first thing we knew is we believe sport has the power to change the world. And our brand is a leader in the space of sport. And so if we began the conversation, we knew our competitors would follow. And we hope that that would pull every industry forward into the right conversation, which was change and change now. And so that was really the beginning of how we thought about our purpose driven point of view. We built something called a purpose playbook for North America. And that was really talking through how we speak to social injustice, how we think about civil equality. And it helped us lean into spaces like registration to vote. I remember calling Mav, Mav used to work at Nike way back when, I'm sure you guys both know this. And so he's also been kind of my uh, personal board of director to say, hey, I'm thinking about this, what do you think? So we talked about registration to vote. Nike's not been in that space before, but now was the time more than any to stand in the gap, to have the right conversations and move our consumers forward. Oh, that's 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 so well said and, and I think spot on. Guys, as you heard in my conversation with Ann, where the, the very concept of entertainment, and we talked about entertainment transform, the very concept of entertainment has changed for us all this year. What kind of expected or unexpected things uh, do you think the consumers have turned to for that entertainment or that, you know, diversion? Um, and it, has it become less important? I, I can well, take it. I, I would say, um, first off, I totally agree 
that I still love watching sports. I try to watch news in the morning, but it's difficult. I flip between all of them, and it's all, you know, hard to watch. So I look forward to the evening with sports. But I would say, and um, the idea of entertainment has always been, obviously, for all of us as humans, at the top of the list of what we're looking for on a day in and day out basis. I think how we get entertained and how you know, what are the distribution pipes that brings it into our homes or into our lives is what's changing the most. But I think as always, I, I always say this because obviously there's lots of conversation about, you know, all the big streaming companies, Netflix, Apple, Amazon, you know, Disney's in it now, all of them coming into the market, lots of stuff. But the truth is, as we all know, quality content is always going to rise to the top real quality content that has very relatable stories like i'm sure we've all seen soul it has a very relatable story about characters that we can all relate to and stories <clears throat> that we all relate to and i think the idea of how and who entertains is what's going to change right so adrian and deb run gigantic organizations for gigantic brands and they now have to figure out how to connect with consumers in ways that weren't thought about 10 or 15 years ago. I think as you talk about what have we seen as change <clears throat> that is entertaining, I think the, the job of the advertiser and Deb and, and the marketer, and Deb and Adrian, obviously fantastic marketers, is going to change from kind of selling things to consumers to more engaging them and entertaining them and keeping the consumer connected to their brand. Now, how they do that is they're going to have to create amazing content, not just ads and commercials that are 30 seconds. They're going to have to tell amazing stories. Both their brands and both of them are very versed at doing this, but it's going to have to be more frequent, more of them. And then the second thing that they have to figure out is the distribution of that content. So it's one thing to make it amazing. And then how do you distribute it? I could very well see, and I think we all see it going that way. And I think the pandemic has sped it up tremendously. If you follow Nike's quarterly earnings, their CEO and CFO talk about it all the time, they you know the digital sales, but really what it is, is how do you really connect and engage consumers and ultimately entertain them to keep them connected to your brand. And also the last thing I would say, that content also has to say who you are as a brand. It really has to do that. Hey, can I just to so, add? So, to Patrick, go just, ahead. Go ahead, Adrian. Sorry, I was going to add to what Mav said because it's spot on. The, the couple things that we've learned, and again, none of this is new. No one is saying that we are uh, breaking rocket science here. But the at the end of the day, the consumer wants content on demand as they want it. Um, and we have to be the brands that understand from a CI perspective. So understanding real time data to know where they are in the journey and serve up the right body of content that is as interactive as it is informative. And so Mav said it beautifully. It's, it's this combination of real time content for us. It could be live workouts, which we launched for the first time during COVID. It could be free NTC workouts in our apps that we launched during COVID. It could be using our influencers like a LeBron, like a Megan Rapino, like a Travis Scott to actually sit down and tell a consumer what they're thinking on a random Tuesday at seven because they're stuck inside as well. And so it's how do we inform and inspire with this content instead of being passive in the conversation the way that brands may have been in the past. It's, it's, it's interesting you say that, Adrian. And, and Deb, look, I know you've got a distinct POV on uh, entertainment and and how it kind of relates to corporate transformation and you are certainly in the middle of a corporate transformation as you move uh, and create that environment around electronic vehicle electric vehicles but um, can you chat a bit about how you see that relative to the utilization of influencers and others in the content that you're looking at to help as I say really be part of a, a, a massive uh, transformation of General Motors yeah, uh, and I think, um, you know, to further the point, we've all seen it's a completely different way of engaging with the consumer, almost much more direct than we did, but also completely different. So we used to do reveals of vehicles that were in, you know, um, in presentation style. We'd have all of our corporate people come in and explain the technology. 
And when we launched the Hummer this year, we did it in a completely different way. Um, we partnered with Maverick and LeBron. We did some things. And actually, between this, I'm thinking, Adrian and Mav, that we could come up with our next version of incredible entertainment as we look at all of this as it comes together. And I really think this year is the age of companies um, doing that and really having to fill that void uh, that we see out there right now in terms of entertainment. And then the exciting part, we had um, the most people attended the Hummer, uh, GMC Hummer EV reveal than one in history and that we'd ever seen before. And I think that was because it was done in an entertaining way. And it's also almost class in a different way because we talked about the technology and EV technology and batteries and what they can power and what they can do in a way that people engaged incredibly. Uh, and we had um, our own people at different levels, not just the most senior people, but all the people who are actually doing the work and creating these amazing technologies and what they're doing. They're coming forth and engaging with everyone too. So I'm excited about it. Uh, as we, I just think, open up our whole purview of not what marketing was, but marketing can be, where it is entertainment, how we engage um, in a completely different way. And we're pursuing that. And the response is amazing. We've gone from probably exponential engagement just as a result of that, from what we saw even two years ago when I thought I was doing great work. <laughs> and now I'm looking at going like, wow, that wasn't good at all. But now we're really learning. And, you know, when when we had all the racial injustice, we called um, Maverick and Robot and just said, hey, give us, how do we do this differently? How do we have totally different conversations about this um, from what we can do? Because I do believe that companies should own up to their role as having a lot of influence. And Adrian, what Nike's done has always been um, motivational for all of our teams. Um, and I, I think we need to own that responsibility and deliver these conversations in a really different way. We engage with Carlos Watson to say like, let's have real talk, real change. Like how do we get people really discussing and engaging on these issues that are super important to all of us so that we can all um, have better lives and our kids can have better lives and that we're making the world actually a better place. Honestly, like seriously, that's what all of our goal is, as we have all this influence and we we've, we've got to really put that forth in that way. So so I've got two questions to kind of wrap. First is Maverick, um, you know, Spring Hill is kind of the way I would describe it, an unapologetic media company. Um, you've gone after giving voice, in my view, to those who have not had voice before it, it, at the center of some of the content, uh, whether it's the creators, the consumers, et cetera. If, if you could talk about that for a moment. Yeah, I would say um, what we try to do and what we strive to be, um, and we wake up every day with this, all of us who work at the Spring Hill Company, is with the idea of that we are a company with a mission and uh, a vision and we have values and we strive to build a community around that mission and that the, at the heart of our mission is empowering greatness in every individual that comes in contact with anything that we do. And, we've, and we work to build a community around this idea of empowerment, truly build a community who care about empowerment. So if you look at some of our taglines for our sports brand uninterrupted more than an athlete. So athletes, it's not for every athlete, but it's for athletes who really care and want to be seen as and do more for the world and do more for their team and their, their people and their community more than just being an athlete. So we really built a community around this idea. And then we built content. We have, you know, we sell consumer products. We do brand collaborations. But we built the community first and engaged that community through content. And we built it by first and foremost empowering the people who work at our company first. And then, because without, if we don't empower them, how can we empower creators and consumers? Guys, back to that last question to wrap up. Is there that one moment? Again, it doesn't have to be a marketing campaign. I, I, I gave away the last dance, but the serendipity of that, the timing of that, it could be anything you've seen in marketing or entertainment that just jumps off the page at you uh, uh, that, that kind of was a game changer uh, in our marketplace. The thing that jumped off the page to me was a, was a cross of marketing, um, discipline, commitment, and, and just execution, which was, and obviously it's, 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 
kind of obvious that I'm saying this, but it really is when you think about the NBA bubble and what all the things that had to come together for that to happen, how good it was for us at home to have, you know, that sport back when they took that break. So if you think about they were in the middle of their season up until March, so they only had, you know, maybe they had a quarter of their season left to stop it for three months, collaborate with Disney, all the players had to be on board. All the players had to be willing to go down to a, stay in a bubble. I mean, the league, I just think that was the, of, of 2020, of all the things that went on, that's the one that kind of jumps off the page and I'll forever remember my whole life. I, 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 I agree with you. Go ahead. I, I'd say um, on our end, it, it really was sport. And I don't want to be this person, but I, I keep coming back to the various, moments that we had as a brand uh, that released into the world. Uh, the Last Dance is one of them. I mean, that was, you know, you realized over the course of several months, there were moments where the world seemed to stop and rejoice through the through the lens of sport, the bubble, the wobble, another one through the lens of sport. And so I think, you know, it was our reminder that sport is bigger than sport. And when the world needs to be um, reinvigorated and find a reason for being and keeping going into that next day, sport is the reason. And so we, you know, the moment that I remember most is our team launching a simple social post that said, play inside and play for the world. Black and white, very simple copy. And it was our highest engaged post in uh, too many years to mention. And it was so simple, but the insight was right. Deb, uh, you, you get to bat clean up here. All right, I, and I'm gonna come at it at a different way. I think um, all those examples show when a group or a collective got focused on what was most meaningful and most important, all of a sudden, all these incredible things happened. And at GM as a company, we went through this incredible transformation. We have a vision of zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. And this was the year that despite all of these challenges going on, everyone inside the company said, we are going to build um, to actually realize that vision. And no matter what, we're not gonna get distracted. Even as dollars were crazy and everything came out, everyone refocused and we said, we're going to build an all electric future. And this company is going to transform to do that. And we did that and we completely reassessed how we launched the Hummer EV and how we engage with people. This is, that's what 2021 is gonna be about. Everybody's in and we're gonna make wow. really significant changes. Taking that as a lead, Deb, I wanna thank you, Adrian and Maverick for being in and being here uh, to open this year uh, uh, with our virtual uh, CES. You guys are not virtual friends, you're great friends, and I'm honored and, and appreciative of you giving your time today, and I'm certain those listening uh, will learn a lot. So thank you, uh, and again, healthy, happy new year to everybody. And we are back. This is CES 2021, the most influential tech show in our solar system. Not sure about other solar systems, but they're still discovering them and we're probably pretty popular there too. We are. My name is Rich Demiro. And I'm Justine Zarek, also known as iJustine. And speaking of influential, as the French Minister for Digital Transition and Electronic Communications, Cedric Go has helped make France into a hub of innovation, and it is definitely paying off. Le French Tech is a network of 13 tech capitals and 38 communities focusing on startups. They are back for the eighth year here at CES, and they've brought over 100 companies to the show. You can search for them by filtering startups and country name. CTA President and CEO Gary Shapiro recently spoke with Minister O. Let's take a look. Minister O, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me uh, today, Gary. Well, as you know, we have such a great tradition between the French government and the CES. It's a focus on innovation. It's a passion we both share. And here we are. It would be very appropriate for you to help us start and launch our first ever purely digital CES, which is not based in Las Vegas. We're here in Redmond, Washington, the home of Microsoft, but we are global today. And so this is going to almost every country in the world. So I ask you, as we're kicking off CES, what are you most excited to see at CES 2021? 
Well, thank you first, Gary, for uh, having me today. As you just mentioned, there has uh, always been a very special relationship between uh, the CS and France, perhaps since uh, 2015 when the, the president, Emmanuel Macron...